let's get started. Uh, so yeah, we're in the midst of looking at social science research on media effects. And, uh, you know, as we said, uh, the results are mixed depending on what particular questions are raised by social science. And once you start looking into it, you realize there's a pretty narrow range of things that have been looked at. Um, and they're often um, motivated by fear or concern for some kinds of uh, assumed media effects. And once people get into studying it, they find out that it's very hard to prove some kind of clear causal relationship between media and some kind of behavior. Um, so uh, that's part of it. So remember, as, as scientists, they uh, typically like to construct what they do in terms of having a theory from that, pulling out a hypothesis, and then conducting you know, something like an experiment or administering a questionnaire, so like a kind of a survey type of thing. Um, or there could be observation in the case of the Bobo doll experiment, which uh, was done way back in the 60s or something. But once you move from there, after that, you consider, you know, have you proved or falsified your hypothesis? Um, and then, you know, you may have to come back and rethink your theory. Um, so that is how it's supposed to work. And, uh, you know, it, this is quote unquote scientific method, right? Because there are lots of other ways that people look at media texts. Like in my classes at State, I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, I did a PhD, so I practiced all of this, but the classes that I teach are more interpretive, critical classes, you know, you're looking at it and talking about, you know, what groups are misrepresented and things like that, versus these people are really looking for psychological and social effects. Um, and I think partly because it was so inconclusive, I was steered more towards, you know, other approaches. So there's, there's a history of this, and uh, we got through... You know, the early attempts at proving strong effects where you're really looking for uh, a, a direct causal relationship between watching something or some kind of media influence and then an effect, some behavior that arises. And it was, you know, spurred on by fears about political influence and propaganda. And, you know, the results were uh, not conclusive by far. Then, you know, changing to a different theory, one of limited effects. So no longer looking for, you know, a, a kind of all-powerful media effect that would affect audiences, uh, you know, equally and, and strongly, uh, but rather thinking through, well, there must be something else. So theorizing potentially a two-step flow, which is good, good results basically in seeing that messages are more persuasive if they run through opinion leaders. As we mentioned, modern-day opinion leaders could be influencers or celebrities uh, that uh, people trust and come to feel some kind of social relationship with, and then they become more influential. And the messages that they deliver are more influential than simply you know, putting an ad out and, and uh, expecting to see a direct causal relation. So some, some benefits out of limited effects, also the notion that audiences are not all alike and that depending on their, uh, you know, belief systems, uh, they may be more or less uh, amenable to persuasion. So, you know, and then uh, they broke it down into exposure, perception, retention. All of these are influenced by the audience's what they call cognition, what's going on in their heads before they even see the message. So if they're conservatives, they might avoid liberal messaging, you know, uh, if they're... If they're liberals, they, they may not even perceive all of the dog whistles that are embedded into, you know, some piece of conservative media. That, that's where the term dog whistle comes from, right? The whole idea that, uh, you know, you can implant their little Bible quotations that your, right, yeah, your New York intellectuals will not get it. But, you know, people in the heartland will remember the story of whoever, <laughs> so, yeah. 
Uh, then, uh, so a certain amount of headway was made with limited effects. And remember, in order to conduct those kinds of experiments, they literally used, you know, thousands of people participating, um, troops mostly. And so they were obliged to do it. Much harder to do that kind of thing without a captive, you know, survey sample because you got to pay people. or and So it often, some of this research happens in universities, like when you get those 250 kids in a lecture room or something for your intro class, often professors will use that as a kind of captive survey audience as well. I hate to say it, it sounds coercive. But, uh, but that's another place where a lot of this kind of research happens because you get enough people. Um, <clears throat> then uh, delving into, you know, more subtle uh, effects. So... Uh, the moderate effects, and we talked about Bandura's experiment with, do you remember the little kids punching out the Bobo dolls? This was in the 1960s. Uh, and, uh, and so making some headway with the idea that, uh, yeah, humans model other human behavior. And the media, uh, you know, is, is influential in that way in that it, it suggests, you know, behaviors to us. And, and, you know, little kids quite casually will reproduce what they see on, uh, on, the, uh, on a television screen. Um, and uh, we talked also about, you know, we talked about a number of things in terms of like pro propaganda and um, um, how, you know, uh, we were talking about collaborating with the military, off, you know, leads to, you know, better imagery. and. I was just thinking about that after the class. There's, there's a, an amazing podcast that's being released right now called Running from Cops. Uh, I'll just write it up here. Um, if you are interested in this kind of thing, I, I'm trying to figure out how I can work it into my new media literacy class or something. But So it's basically, um, uh, it, it's a very good podcast production crew. I think they did a podcast called Murder Town or Murderville or something, which I listen to a bunch of. This one's about the influence of the show Cops, which has been on for 30 years and has, you know, uh, changed the way people view policing. And, uh, and it's a real, you know, I was about to say S show or something, but yeah, we, we, we know what goes on on Cops. There's like lots of low-level busts and stuff, but I mean, they, have, they have just some, some amazing um, Excerpts from the show. They interview people who were on the show, you know, who were coerced into signing releases and stuff. But one thing that's really very interesting is they they talk to the producers, you know, about and and the executives. It was it started at Fox, and and you know they saying, well, you know, have you do you realize that you know there's well, a very high percentage of people of color who are the perps, and you know, in fact, it doesn't track with what the, you know, the actual statistics are, um, and so on and so forth. And the producers try to push back, and uh, one weapon that the podcast producers have is they and their team sat through every episode of 30 seasons of Cops and actually did the content analysis. Like, who's busted? You know, what, what, what is their ethnicity? What is their gender? What is their age? All this kind of stuff. In what kinds of context, what kinds of crimes are they busted for? And very interesting because at that point, you know, you've got the producers saying, no, we don't discriminate. And they can say, well, actually, we looked at every damned episode and the rate of people of color being busted is twice as high. Uh, you know, the, the rate of drug busts, drug busts, prostitution, and like kind of disturbing the peace type of minor misdemeanors way, way higher than, yeah. So, and they could only do this, they could only do this having done a very careful content analysis. So, I mean, it's pretty amazing that a podcast would go to those lengths. So I highly recommend it. Running from Cops, it's called. It's only six episodes, and it's being released. You can find it on, you know, Stitcher or all those podcast places. Apple. Is it like an hour long each one? Each one's about a half hour, I'd say. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's yeah. Short yeah. Okay. yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, and it goes, I mean, I find it goes really fast because yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, definitely. I'm such a sucker for these things. <laughs> so you hear the producers, you hear, you hear like the execs at, 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 you know, Fox who are like, yeah, we just really needed a show that would be cheap to produce. <laughs> and then, you know, this guy brought us this, this, 
you know, demo footage of like drug busts in Florida. And it was like, man, that's incredible. Let's do a few, you know, and it was, that's how it all started. And, uh, and they even have, they have clips they found on YouTube of like little kids like playing, saying, get down on your knees, put your hands behind your head, or I'll hurt you. You know, it's like, like literally, literally doing the cop stuff. They got little kids singing the, the theme song of cops. Off of, you know, oh, it's really good. It's pretty good. It's got a lot of good stuff in it. Anyway, so um, I wanted, you know, just sticking, you know, there's, there's a lot, uh, of course, here, but just sticking with this, the, the, the concept of violence and the media violence um, uh, research. Um, as as I, I think I mentioned last time, and in our class there is some links to some videos where people are discussing just this type of research that was done, you know, in the hopes of proving a causal relationship between watching media and uh, co committing violent acts. And, uh, you know, uh, despite decades of trying to construct research to do that, because we're obviously fearful of mass shootings and things like that, so we do think it's, this is a really important thing to understand. But having done the, the you know, various methods of research, the, the results are certainly not as conclusive as you would simply assume they, they would be, you know. Um, and there's differences of interpretation as well. So where, as I said last class, as we ended up, what they found is that, you know, uh, kids who are more aggressive, well, people in general, it's not just done on kids, this research. So more aggressive people tend to watch media with more aggressive events in it. Whether there's a causal relationship or not has, cannot be proved, you know. And so and, and it's too difficult to sort out, uh, you know, whether it's the person who gets drawn to the media or whether the media, you know, influences the person around this issue of violence. Um, but uh, the, the, what I wanted to show you now is a little bit of a documentary that is on Canopy, by the way. So if you're a public library... Uh, uh, member, you can get access to this, and through City College's Canopy account, I think we could get access to it. Uh, so this is a discussion of, of research that was called, it's called Cultivation Theory, uh, and this is a, a, a researcher, I mean, he's dead now, but he did his, he spent his career at Stanford, and um, so this is, this is a kind of an alternative approach to media violence that doesn't look for a direct effect, and it is, um, it has been successful. So just, I'm, I'm kind of starting this video where I think it's good, but I didn't have a chance to really run through it and find exactly the spot. Um, so let's say that George Gerbner was a professor at Stanford, and for years he had graduate students doing content analysis of the news. So just like the podcast people looked at 30 seasons of cops, and basically had a series of data points that they wanted to gather on, like who's arrested, what were they doing, what part of the show is it at, what is their ethnicity, age, gender, that type of thing. So you can imagine you go to this with a list of questions and a bunch of codes, so then you would go through and say, okay, season 15, episode 2, and you would start coding it and saying, you know, this happens, this happens, this happens. So... Gerbner pioneered some of this at Stanford with, you know, an endless stream of graduate students who were trapped into doing this type of research, which is incredibly dull, but can make your career. Uh, and, you know, looking at the news. So what kind of news, you know, stories are out there? How much of it is about violent crime? Who are the people who commit the violent acts on the news and stuff? So it's even more important in a way than... Um, cops because this purports to really be the news, you know, which is more real than reality TV. So, um, and uh, Gerbner uh, came away, I hope they explained this well, but he came away with a theory, cultivation theory, which basically is that society may not be more violent, but the effect of seeing so much violence on the media makes people fearful. They think that society is more violent. Uh, and so it's more about, you know, impression than it is about uh, kind of factual uh, uh, causal relationships. It's more about, like, giving people a background sense that 
things are scary, you know. And this sets up things like, you know, Donald Trump with his uh, carnage in America speeches, you know. It's like, uh, it's just like, you know, the slums are overwhelmed with violent people. And it's like, what? What is this? You know? <laughs> so um, I, think it, I think it all plays into that. So uh, hopefully I drop us into a, a, a decent part of this. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Mar-a-Lago is surrounded. <laughs> okay, let's just see if uh, I got volume up and stuff. That's full up. And that's full up. And is the projector full up? So that's going down. Okay, this is all the volume we got. A mediated environment. The question is how to measure the effects of a force that is present from the start. A sea of images, as media scholar Marshall McLuhan liked to say, that has become so familiar to us that we're often as blind to its all-encompassing presence as a fish is to water. It's like the fish in the water. We don't know who discovered water, but we know it wasn't a fish. A pervasive medium, a pervasive environment, is always beyond perception. We have become so accustomed uh, to our cultural environment, uh, it's like a uh, fish that doesn't know that it's swimming in water because it has never experienced anything else. This leads us to the notion of cultivation. Cultivation is a stable system of messages and images that shape our conception of the world and of ourselves and of life itself and of society and of power. <laughs> now the question is, how do you measure cultivation? This is a research problem that we faced and we resolved it in the following way. We give surveys to large groups of uh, representative respondents. Uh, these surveys have a series of questions, not about television, not about media, but these are questions about life, question about security, question about values, question about attitudes. For example, we asked them, what are your chances of encountering violence on an average weeknight? Is it one in a hundred or one in fifty? We asked, would you be reluctant to go down on the street in your own neighborhood at night? Yes or no? Then we separate the responses into heavy and light viewers. We find that in almost every instance, the heavy viewers exhibit a greater sense of insecurity. And we attribute that to the great frequency of violence and country on television. The response pattern of heavy viewers tends to converge into what we call the television mainstream. So that with heavy viewers, the usual differences among different social groups, the differences of age, of gender, of income, of education, begin to erode. The heavy viewers, for all practical purposes, live in a meaner world. They integrate and absorb a sense of, of danger, of mistrust, of meanness in the world is what we call the mean world syndrome. You always have to look over your shoulder. A lot of times you might feel uneasy if somebody's walking by you. You feel like you're always like on guard. To get a handle on what Gerbner means by the mean world syndrome, it's not enough to analyze individual TV programs or films or video games. The entire media context is what matters how one kind of story or program blends into another to create and reinforce a distinct view and sense of the world. Getting to the heart of the mean world syndrome, then, requires taking a look at TV the way most of us experience it at home, when we're not in classrooms thinking about these things, by simply picking up the remote and doing a little channel surfing. When we do, with every change of the channel, we're likely to see the most banal content alternating with the most bizarre and violent and frightening. <laughs> so that what would be shocking in our real lives in the media world comes to seem normal and mundane, reinforcing the sense that the world is a yeah, there it is. constant danger and threat. A world of psychotic killers. Can you imagine smashing a person's teeth out and cutting off their fingers? <clears throat> Child abductors. Prosecutors say he raped children and tried to infect them with the AIDS virus. Murder and mayhem. The mayhem spreads to the back office. Oh. Disease and plague. A highly contagious strain of bird <laughs> flu. Flying flu deaths in the United States are rising. It's a toxic chemical used in rocket fuel 
and it's showing up in milk and drinking water. Threats of war. Defiance will invite the severest consequences. Invasions of the end times. Satan is no myth. He is a monster who will rob, kill, and destroy you and you and you. He will rob you. <laughs> <laughs> the wrath of God, the wrath of nature. We're on the air. We just got word that five people are trapped in a canyon. This kind of smoke was apocalyptic. Where people are animals. Brian Jensen Jenkins is an animal. An animal's attack. Oh Even in the safety of our own homes. No matter how tame our pets may seem, they never completely lose their basic animal instincts, like hunting and fighting. And that's never more obvious than when two animals square off against each other. The results can be terrifying. Because waiting on the other side was a ravenous <laughs> <tenfold arm. laughs> I'll never see a pet port the same way. <laughs> the faceless dog begins to suffocate her. That snake took away my best friend. <laughs> Sometimes is of a mean world in which predators of every stripe and every species seem forever on the loose. Across the state, thousands of pythons are on the loose. A serial killer and a serial gunman are on the loose, and until they're caught, nobody is safe. With the news media in particular, because you will die. Nightly carnival of the most terrifying stories. Police believe this is the very moment she was abducted. She told of the four days she was chained, raped, and tortured in a Virginia townhouse. A New Jersey woman has been charged with murdering her brother-in-law after she spiked his fruit punch with antifreeze. Six people accused of organizing fights in a school for the mentally disabled. He's accused of shooting a man in the head at a four-year-old's birthday party over the weekend. And this sensationalism is especially true with local news, which is the primary news source for two-thirds of Americans, with 61% of all lead stories on the local news dedicated to crime, fires, disasters, and accidents. And with so intense and constant a focus on these kinds of stories across the broadcast airwaves, it stands to reason that the more TV you watch, the more you might develop a sense of the world as a scary and dangerous place. I have to do what I can to protect myself and my children. And that's a fact of life, a way of life. What cultivation analysis has done is to show how these kinds of anxieties and insecurities are caught up explicitly with media culture, uncovering a direct correlation between the amount of television one watches and the level of fear one has of being victimized. If you look at it from a cultivation point of view, you see that the image of victimization, the image of risk, the image of danger, the conception that if there is so much violence in the world, I'm, I'm at risk, not that I'm going to go down the street to be a mugger. But on the contrary, I'm afraid to go down the street at night. I'm afraid to go into the subways. I'm afraid uh, of strangers. I try to cross the street when I see somebody that I think may be dangerous to me. These are the the consequences of exposure to violence that are cultivated in large communities over long periods of time. The finding that if you watch a lot of TV, you're likely to be more afraid of violence than those who watch less TV, may help explain why so many people seem to think violent crime is far worse than it actually is. A widespread misperception that started to be noticed a decade ago when crime rates began to drop. Here is the reality. Violent crime per capita actually dropped slightly in the latest figures released by the Justice Department. Nationwide, murder was down 5%. But the perception continues to dominate reality, triggering a fear that is out of sync with statistics, a fear that no one and no place is safe anymore. And when you're always on guard, it's hard to let go of fear, no matter what the reality. And this classic example of the mean world syndrome continues today. In fact, since that ABC News report about falling crime rates, Justice Department figures show that violent crime has dropped an additional 43% to a remarkable 30-year low. Anderson, the FBI says violent crime dropped 2.5% in 2008. Now, that includes an overall 4.4% decline in murders. But, but despite the steady drop, good. polls have consistently shown that most Americans believe just the opposite to be true. The crime has actually been increasing. 
three quarters of Americans <coughs> say there is more crime in the United States than there was a year ago. Gallup's annual crime poll shows it's the highest level since the early 1990s. The poll also finds 51% of Americans say there is more crime in their local area than there was a year ago. When we see reports like this, is it any wonder that Americans seem more intent than ever on protecting themselves? Speaking of hitting home, check this out. I'm a firearms instructor in Nassau County, Florida. Last weekend, we had 18 people go through our courses to get concealed weapons carry licenses. The number of people getting these licenses is astounding. Everyone expresses a fear of being attacked. When I go to Jacksonville's concert hall downtown, I go heavily armed because one of the neighborhoods west of there is the fourth deadliest in America. Imagine listening to Mozart carrying a 357 Magnum. Oh, tough, tough stuff. Indeed, scary stuff. All right, Jack, thank you. Business is booming at gun shops across the country. One man ran into a Walmart and said, sell me all the <coughs> ammo you have. Pistols, shotguns, even ammunition are flying off the shelves. There may be no better illustration of what Gerbner means by the mean world syndrome than the fact that gun sales have risen sharply during exactly the same period that crime has dropped sharply. The majority of this spike occurring over just the past three years alone, despite record declines in violent crime across the board. Crime may be down, but for some reason, fear doesn't seem to be. I've always been pro-gun control, and suddenly I'm going, I don't know, maybe I should own a gun. We could fall into chaos. Well, chaos is a good reason to be able to protect yourself. Yeah, people that are depressed, people that might be upset, you know, carrying around a gun, you know, just, you feel comfortable. You feel like you, you have a little bit of power. You're protecting yourself from Americans going crazy, rioting, looting, and hurting each other. You must feel good about it. And I've been through Y2K and I've been through 9-11. I have never seen people so afraid. The logical question is why? Why do fear and anxiety about violence seem to be rising even when the threat of violence is falling? Well, surveys consistently show that upwards of two-thirds of the people who believe crime to be a very serious personal problem say they get most of their news from television. This is the breakthrough of cultivation analysis, a clear correlation between the amount of media we consume and the degree of fear and anxiety we have about the world. A phenomenon that comes into especially clear focus when we look at how we view and treat others, especially those who are different from us. One of Gerbner's most important contributions was to reveal the human costs of the mean world syndrome. And he did this by looking carefully at how different groups are portrayed and not portrayed in television and movies. Most of us live rather insulated lives and we don't meet too many people of other groups, of other races, of other ethnic backgrounds than our own. Most of what we know about other races, other ethnic groups, we know from television. And on television, we get some very peculiar type of information. For example, while Latinos are the fastest growing demographic group in the United States, currently representing about 15% of the nation's population, they make up only about 6% of all characters in television and movie drama. And when they are represented, it's overwhelmingly as characters in a world of violence. The Hispanic Americans are probably the most violent group on the American television. They hold still. <laughs> Latinos are usually portrayed as doing harm to others or as deserving of white violence and justice. And beyond the world of fiction, in the so-called real world, they don't fare any better. The war on our border with Mexico is very real. This is the kind of violence that Border Patrol agents face every day as they try to protect our country from illegal activity. With little in the world of TV and film drama to balance the image, 
Latinos are mentioned over and over again in popular news and talk programs when they're mentioned at all in the context of a single issue. It's, it's very simple. Illegal immigration, 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 between 12 and 20 million illegal immigrants in this country. Illegal immigrants, 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 all illegal immigrants, millions of illegal immigrants in the country. Including minutes. Okay. Yeah. I think they made the point. <laughs> Pretty wild, huh? There's a, we might watch next week, I don't know, there's a film called Out Fox. Has anybody seen Out Fox? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Kind of crowdsourced uh, the Fox news coverage. And, and there's only 100 days till the re-election of George W. Bush. And it's like, well, what do you guys think uh, of this whole mess that we're looking at there? It's exactly why I don't watch the news. <laughs> of any kind, local, cable, anything, I just don't watch Yeah, news. yeah. That's one, uh, that's one reaction to it, definitely. And, yeah, possibly. Yeah, it's just so biased. Like there's, I mean, there's no, uh, no real journalism being done. It's Understood, yeah. I mean, it's a lot more, you know, as they said, 60%. If, what is it? If it bleeds, it leads, right? Right. And that's the most profitable strategy for exactly. getting ratings up is to show people scary stuff so they tune in. To yeah. It. I was going to say, do you think it's worth it to, uh, like, take money out of the news, make it be, like, federally funded about tax dollars? Oh, wow. So they don't have to rely on commercials <laughs> and all that stuff. They'll present this with stuff that we can actually, like, Information we yeah. used to... Well, coming from Canada where there is not, you know, exclusive, but there's a strong, you know, government presence in news because they have the CBC or the BBC, you know, that often becomes like a kind of a, you know, an accusation of bias writ large. It's like whenever the BBC says something, they got to say something that counterbalances that. And, you know, and so it's, um, it, it's often becomes a... A bit of a mess in that way, in the you know the, the the news is attacked as being government propaganda, right. or you know the government is attacked as pushing a bias through the news operation. So but there's, really there's like, downsides there too. Can, can we just get to Julian because he had his hand up yeah, first? Right. It was I was going to say something about the fact that a lot of these news, a lot of news is like 24 hours too. It's like it's just constantly trying to grab your attention oh. with the most brutal, like the most brutal story that they can put out there. Yeah, yeah. stickers at the bottom. Or yeah, and a lot of the examples, the worst example, like Lou Dobbs and stuff. You right. know, there's, there's, there's there, on regular network TV, there's not enough time to dedicate to that kind of constant rant and drumbeat. But, but we know that they have huge audiences. What's the discussion? Uh, we're talking just about what we saw and the consequences of basically media creating such a fearful climate. Yeah, basically. no, it was interesting to watch that because like. I, I feel like, because, like, the more people watch TV, the more they had fear and paranoia. Yeah. So it makes me think, why do we even consume the news? Mm. Was, Chris was just saying that, yeah. yeah like, I don't even watch why news at all. Yeah, no, because like, it's, it's just mad scary. Yeah. Like, there's never, like, something nice unless, I mean, like, it depends on where you live for, like, something nice. Because, like, in the nicer cities of California, I noticed on the news, it's just, like, this amazing thing happened today, you know? Okay. Because like, of like it's more the, positive news. Yeah, like like in the in like certain local places, like I feel like there there's a higher chance for positive news mm. depending on what area you're in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Like in suburbs I notice like, like the news is much more light. <laughs> like it's mm. not it's nothing too It's an interesting idea. But yeah. in LA it's just like Murder. Yeah. <laughs> any any kind of urban context, you yeah. get there's plenty of opportunity, and some of it has to do simply with the they call it the you know news philosophy of the station. Some of them have slightly different approaches to like how they fear monger, or you know as you say they could lead with more positive stories, uh, and and if they find that their ratings are better based on that. Yeah. Keep, yeah. keep away. We don't often hear from you. Anything to say on this one? Or? I thought it was kind of just basically everybody piggybacking on it. Okay. Okay. Not just watching it. It's not either. Mostly just CNN. 
but even CNN is like mostly about Democrats, and Fox is like Republicans. I was kind of surprised to see almost, you know, like there was a balance in there. There was plenty of CNN fear, yeah. fearful talk as well as Fox. Yeah. And that was... So it's like it's always, they always trying to feed on a type of bias, a type of view for different Americans. So. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's what gets ratings. Yeah. Isn't Fox like a Republican network as well? Like, like don't they have like the whole, like... It feels like that now. Yeah. I, I, thought, I thought it <laughs> was. Evangelical <laughs> network. Like... Yeah. Like when it comes to politics, I feel like Fox has like a lot of crazy politic opinions on there. Like mm. I don't know if it's just Fox. I, would, I think CNN does it too. The whole po- like the politics thing. And yeah. MSNBC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I feel like on Fox especially, it's just like more controversial. Yeah, the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it's it's so there's Fox the television network which is less like that and then there's the Fox 24 hour news channel which is totally like that right? <laughs> which used to be you know the boss was Roger Ailes who was like a Nixon campaign manager communication specialist so you know he he you know learned at the Republican you know <laughs> in the Republican world and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, totally, you know, just whatever bias is going to work to get us elected. Yeah. Hired by Rupert Murdoch, who global media tycoon in every country that he's involved in. He promotes conservative politics in England, Australia, United States, you know, everywhere, right? So that guy, as the, you know, the, the owner of Fox News, has a political bias as well. And then on top of that, it's been for years the number one rated, you know, 24-hour news channel. Yeah. So it makes great business sense to be so biased as well. So there's so many reasons that Fox is what it is. Yeah. This is there's, a, there's a research out that says people that watch Fox News are less informed than people who don't watch TV. Yeah, that's huh. right. Because they're feeling misinformation. Oh, wow. They're actually less informed than people... Oh. I'd like to, if you, if you ever see a link to that or something, send it. Yeah, I've seen the same report. Yeah. I, I feel yeah. like lately, like, a lot of news channels, I think it's, like, like a lot of, like, political fear mongering in a yeah. way. Because, like, yeah. it's, it's less about, like, oh, this one serial killer. It's not like that. It's more, like, just, like, politician stuff. Mm. I feel like lately, like, everything is a lot more political. I don't know if it's always been like this. But, like, I feel like as of late, yeah, things have been a lot yeah, more political, especially with, like, Trump and, like, his whole crew being, like, like investigated by the FBI. Like, now yeah. even more so, everyone's talking like, talking about, like, impeaching people and, like, sending, like, these government officials to jail. Right, I feel right. like now more than ever. And Trump, you know, recently hired as communications director for the White House, a guy who had to leave Fox because of sexual harassment allegations. So, you know, yeah, again, like a super well, you know, how could I put it? A super ideological and connected media guy comes over to the White House. And, you know, um, and Sean Hannity, you know, like sort of number one conservative talking head like jumps up on stage with Trump and stuff. So so the ties are tighter than ever, you know. And again, it also comes back to kind of an economic reason. You know, there's, there's you know, there's 24 hours of Fox or CNN or MSNBC to fill. And there's not enough, like, you know, crazy stuff to report on. So instead you get people, like, shouting at each other about their political viewpoints, you know, and then... That fills up an enormous amount of time, you know. And so that's that's part of where that has become. I mean, do you think it's fair that uh, Gerbner, you know, this film, this, 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 what we saw up here, uh, breaks down in a pretty detailed way, you know, the different kinds of fear that are promoted in the public, but it tends to, you know, be blurry about the media. Like, it's just news. And then you'll see... You know, Fox News and, and MSNBC, and or Fox News and CNN, I definitely noticed there. Or local news, or, you know, America's Most Wanted, or, you know, um, primetime, you know, cop shows and stuff like that. It all kind of gets mixed in in this film. Do you think uh, the, the media is equally culpable, or should we pull that apart a little bit 
to be more you know discerning as to which part of the media actually might create this. I don't know, Chris. I think like for the purpose of their survey, they're taking all of media as a whole, even, yeah. even if it maybe wasn't all represented in this uh, short documentary. But like for their survey, they were looking at news, they were looking at film, video games, television, mm-hmm. so, mm. and so I think it's kind of like you know the fishbowl. Yeah. Yeah. Sense. And, and that's part of what makes this, I think, it's a good point. And it's kind of pushing against where I was thinking. But as you say it, I realize they kind of say, well, you know, we're, we're looking at the whole media environment as, you know, this kind of mean world. So, yeah. And so each individual little piece is, you know, something that a regular media theorist would look at. But the whole effect is what they were trying to do. Does, it is interesting. And, man, is it ever convincing as you see the red line of crime, you know, falling know. nationally? And it's like, well, why is everybody so much more scared? And, and so how do you think it plays, like, a big a Sandy Hook or a big, you know, massacre plays into this? People, people are now, like, I guess afraid of everyone because anyone could be a mass shooter. I feel like now people are like hella paranoid at like at any festival now. People are mass paranoid. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and like we're gonna argue. Where do they have those? Where at schools. Where, at schools. At, yeah. 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 Every school I thought you meant soon girl. right now, like today oh. we're gonna have oh, we're gonna have uh, one? Wait, <laughs> what? Right we, we had we had we so we had one for faculty anyway. Oh my Did god, you? Yeah, yeah. I don't agree with Not for everybody. Teachers. Are you Pardon me? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Teacher with a three fifty seven. Like emergency. Remember they were talking yeah. about that though? They put armed guards in every school and yeah. stuff. Yeah, no, like, arming even, the teachers. Yeah, yeah yes. High school, right. Well we had like no, this cop good. with like a big gun in my high school, which is really scary. Really? Yeah, yeah. And then that's the guy who's hiding outside when something actually exactly. does. Exactly. <laughs> But I guess it does, you know, it becomes, um, I mean, terrorism in general or these violent acts, they, because they can't take up so much media time and they get so much exposure, then they have, you know, probably even more effect in, in, in the mean world. You know what I mean? Because it's like, uh, um, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear people talking about fear as, you know, a kind of pretty primitive psychological you know, self-preservation thing, right? I mean, we all needed to be able to run away from the big beast chasing us in the forest, right? And then a, a lot of people will talk about, you know, we're basically evolutionarily adapted to that. When you get media which kind of is constantly playing danger at us all the time, it creates a kind of a level of stress and of, of you know, chaos and fear. And I even hear that discussed lately in terms of politics, you know, that... If you keep if you keep a part of the population scared, then they're more likely to go towards you know extreme measures against those you know caravans coming up invading us. And, the law and order candidate. That's right? true. Right? Yeah. Kira, do you feel that way too? Yeah. I think it's true. If you keep a good part of America extremely scared, you pretty much have control over them because they're they're going to listen to anything that can make them less scared. But and like, uninformed. Yeah, right. and like. Making them listen to things to make them less scared can it's just like a form of control in mm-hmm. my opinion. Like mm-hmm. well, oh, because you're scared I'm gonna tell you these things so you could like continue listening to me so you can feel better. Right, right. Because I'm the only person who tells you the truth because of right. right. He was uh same guy, <laughs> Trump. I'm the only one that can fix this. Right. He did say throughout the campaign, I'm the only one that can fix this. Right. Right. Like, what? <laughs> and that was Nixon's approach too. That was Nixon's approach. Yeah, the same thing. The whole Law and Order. Strong. Like, the guy is going to bring safety and yeah, your your country's your hell, life. and I'm the only one could fix right. it. Everything's going down the drain. I'm going to bomb other people. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, it is, you know, for all that we try to encourage, well, watch the news, be informed, be a good citizen. And then, you know, on uh, on this side, you look at it, it's like, well, the news is just sending out to scare the shit out of you, so don't watch, don't, don't watch it, you know, we were saying, you know. Just read a book. Uh, <laughs> just read a book. <laughs> uh, 
There's something also called agenda setting, like to, to talk to what Rick has been talking about, the, which, again, we would I'd love to see the actual reporting on, on the research. But I sent it to you. Oh, and thank you. Oh, thanks. Fantastic. I'm going to take a look at it. So there's this thing called agenda setting, which is uh, well-established you know, media research as well. The ability of... Uh, of the news to kind of uh, direct the national d discussion as to what is important, power to influence the importance of events. Um, so they, uh, they call it gatekeeping back in the day when there were only a few networks. And so if your issue could get onto the you know national nightly news and people would talk about it, it would you know gather attention, and you would get you know sometimes people would say, well, why are we talking about this and not some other problem, right? And so there's been a lot of research as to you know what what uh, what what issues actually do get discussed. And, and as Rick was talking about, you know the the, um, the the television viewer as being less informed than the average person. And you see on the clip that we just watched the endless immigration, 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 immigration. You know. That is kind of a function of agenda setting where they're going to make one or two issues the very most important stuff. And you won't hear about anything else. You'll hear, you know, recycling of, of conspiracy theories or, you know, the latest kind of tiny little thing about Hillary Clinton's email or something. And you'll miss everything else going on in the world because those are the ones that have, you know, been set on the agenda of the 24-hour news channels. So, I mean, this research has been done not just to Fox, in fact, probably not to Fox, but mostly to, to the news for sure, but the network news, you know, which would have maybe time for eight to ten stories in a night. And, you know, again, things would break through, like, you know, caravans, people trying to enter the United States, and those would be like just constantly leaned on. So if anything, it seems like that's getting even stronger. <coughs> more and more time media spent, more and more people, you know, sometimes they, they say people spend up to 11 hours a day watching media. But, you know, if the, if the agenda is so narrow, you don't learn that much. I know my mom is like addicted to MSNBC. Like she, she must be a very frustrated person right now. Yeah, <laughs> totally. But it's like, I mean, she, she can't go long without having it on. You know? Oh, yeah. She just like, that's where she, she just loves watching that. And it's the same thing. It's like, even though it's liberal, but it's still, like, very biased. And it's just people arguing politics all day long and then the ticker's at the bottom. Yeah. Telling you what to be afraid of or what's happening in the news. You know, it's just, yeah. it's not good. And it seems to happen to older people. I yeah. mean, I feel it happening to myself. You know, less less agile mentally, more just looking for confirmation about my biases. Right. It's scary. Don't get old, guys. <laughs> well, since I've come late, I think I should at least say something about this. The Go ahead. You're 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 as informed as the average Fox viewer. In the past, you forget Hitler used the power of mass media over radio and uh, still image ads to <coughs> broadcast his message and yes. get the masses. That was, that was, you know, so the model, <coughs> the model propagandist. <laughs> Can I show him one of my favorite clips? Uh, sure. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> Forgot about that guy. Let's just see. Uh, yeah, you're funny. Hilarious. <laughs> Where's some good? Um, <coughs> See the guy with the. There's a clip here which is kind of stunning as to how overt it is. Where is it? Wow, it's hard to find. All of a sudden, there's tons of this stuff. I take it back. Or what I said earlier about the government uh, <laughs> using our tax money to uh, well, pay for the use. Well, I was thinking the pesky thing called the Constitution, where the government right. can't right. actually. <laughs> <years. laughs> But I was thinking about when you said that, like, I mean, we do have an NPR and PBS, which is partially, 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 partially government-funded yeah. and partially private-funded, which I think is a good... Uh, news Hour. I watch the News Hour. They're from the towns, like, yeah. PBS News Hour. <coughs> Wow, this is, sorry, it's real tough to find. I used to, they would always show up as first, uh, kind of like the first hit. And uh, I'll just see. Let's see. 
Maybe if I don't say t- to you, but... Sometimes you Google it, you'll get a better uh, result. Perhaps, yeah, it's true. <coughs> Great, I'm just trying to see. If you don't. Let's just see, yeah. Let's see if it's going to be all like kittens and puppies if you click on the video. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, like, that's really rewriting history right there. That's right. <laughs> I think it's Stuffy this, bowl. this one was posted by someone named Alan Hilter. <coughs> Sounds like a pseudonym to me. Yeah, this is yeah. Wait, Sorry about the sound. Okay, read the subtitles. I've heard my bit of North Korean. You know the North Korean? Um, every time they look at the North Korean, she's The lady. She's such verbal. Like, I don't know, you probably YouTube it. Like, the like half North Korean. Well, okay. like, and she, she celebrates the latest missile launch yeah, or something? The way they talk, the way they talk, the way they talk is how she does the, the fervor, though. Yeah, yeah, she's like, really like. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, well, it's that last clip which really freaks me out, like when they, you know, when they talk about those concert camps, right? Those foreign exchange uh, musicians. beat around the bush with that. Right, right. It's like, wow. Yeah. So when they mention TV parlors, it's because it's early days of television, right? Like you guys remember, it was in 1939 at the World's Fair here in New York where we rolled out TV in... Uh, the USA. So, you know, we're looking at early days of TV in Germany. And, and so they would, put, uh, they would put the TVs in bars and in post offices and force people to go and watch them. Uh, so, you know, you had to show up and watch the, the television. And then, you know, there was like an hour of propaganda a night or something like that, which was like entertainment mixed in with this constant. Brainwashing. Yeah, it's like, again, you know, that, that's why the strong effects tradition was so concerned, right? They, they were, they were, if, if literally there was brainwashing that was possible, then th- this is the kind of thing that would motivate them to, to find out about it. Yeah. It'd, be see, it'd be interesting to see how their tactics are different or similar to North Korea's today, like with the new technology North Korea has, like how do they differ from that propaganda. Yeah. 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 There, there are people who look into like the aesthetics of propaganda. I mean, these, these, if you guys have seen Triumph of the Will, has anyone seen that movie? It's all, the whole thing's on YouTube. It's, uh, you know, Hitler's documentarist. She did a film on the Olympics and she also did this Triumph of the Will, which was about the Nuremberg rallies. And it's like, whoa. It's like textbook how to film, how to film huge groups of people you know, it's like a choreography of power. And like this one little raisin is Hitler. And then there's just like this sea of people who are like doing their thing. It's just, nothing could say more about, you know, the power of a single individual. So, yeah. Ah, it's gross. And of course, now you got our president who wants to have military parades, right? Yeah. It's like, Jesus. Like, what, what else is that for except for that? I mean, really? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe. <laughs> I. I if anyone's a Republican right now, they probably feel like they can't speak up. And I apologize for that, but, you know, really. 
I'm perfectly open to the idea there's liberal propaganda as well. Trump. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rick, as you were saying, you know, we're experts at it in some yeah. other context. Yeah. 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 So thank you for giving some balance. We're allowed to have and say what we want to. True. But there's also responsibility. And what, what gets amplified, though, is only a tiny subset, you know, which uh, it, that... Uh, <laughs> You know, we can all talk, but will it will it be like constantly repeated to millions and millions of people? You know, that's that's part of an issue. Uh, well, as I turn to my slides or something, I mean, we have a choice of either talking more or doing a cahoot. What can we do? We can just talk. Talk more. We can talk more. <laughs> but then, if we talk more, then we have to look at those dreaded slides. <laughs> oh my God! Let me just see what else. Watch more crap. Okay, not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It took a long time yeah, to find such a horrible clip, too. Yeah, yeah, give it critique. Ooh, we could pull up, like, uh, some North Korean propaganda, because they get, like, um, special effects in there with, like, explosions and stuff. Yeah. Oh, my God. The rocket's heading to okay. California. How about this? How about this bad language in broadcasting, all right, which also falls under this chapter yeah, because, like, because, you know, there, uh, we do, as Fenris was saying, we have a, a tradition of First Amendment guarantee of freedom of speech, which everyone fails to recognize that it, that only applies to the government smothering individual speech. Facebook can do it all they want, but the government can't do it. Um, and so uh, generally, whenever the FCC tries to punish some broadcaster for something they put on the air, they push back, and it has gone to the Supreme Court a couple of times as to uh, you know, the, even the right of the FCC to police content. So some exceptions have been carved out for free speech. For instance, there's limitations on what you can say to kids, like basically advertising over the air, on the logic that kids are not as competent as adults to, you know, fend, you know, in, in the information, uh, you know, free speech model. It's like, well, kids, you know, you can't advertise to them in ways that are deceptive and stuff. Um, in fact, there are rules about advertising in general. So those are limitations on free speech. And also obscenity uh, or offensive language, which is treated slightly differently, there's also exceptions there. You can't just, you know, say anything you like on broadcast TV. Uh, so uh, this comes out of Miller versus California, which was a uh, um, uh, determinant of uh, the rules about obscenity are uh, created on a state state level. So state by state, they have different rules about obscenity. You know, like what can be taken as obscenity and also what the punishment is, is determined on a statewide basis. So the FCC, which is the Federal <coughs> Communications Commission, does not get involved in that. They deal with offensive speech. So we can tell you about that in a second. So what is their uh, definition of obscenity? Uh, that the average person, contemporary community standards, work taken as a whole appeals to what they call the prurient interest. And prurient would mean something that could make you horny, basically, I guess. Now, there's an academic definition. Uh, the second part, something that depicts sexual conduct in patently offensive way, or something that lacks serious literary, artistic, political, scientific value. So, so looking at the obscenity tests, what would you see as you know some of the some of the difficulties of actually enforcing this? Uh, what do you consider offensive? Like yeah. who, de who decides? What's who decides? Yeah, there. Like contemporary community standards. What is do we that? do we have? No, I mean with shit like Family Guy and like American Dad out here, like. That shit's not okay sometimes. Mm -hmm. like, sometimes it's like really like offensive and bad. And yeah. It's because no one really cares. Like it's it's just funny. I, I feel like lately like obscene things are more funny because like so much scary shit is happening. So like now funny things are like actually about like scary things, but they're just making it into jokes. Yes. So, well, I mean, the, the, the definition of obscenity is more narrow, and I don't think Family Guy or American Dad would ever get there because, A, they're animated, B, they're careful, they're careful enough to not cross the line. Definitely offensive, yes. Offensive to particular communities, right? Uh, so uh, the offensive 
test is different, and that is actually uh, decided on by the FCC. So that is a whole federal thing uh, in terms of, but obscenity is, again, on a state-by-state basis, and part of the difficulty of actually enforcing it is, you know, it comes down to a judge's opinion as to what are the contemporary community standards. And, uh, you know, so again, in different parts of the country, something could be considered obscene and not in other parts of the country. But what if it's like, um, you know how like in art classes they have like a nude model or something? Mm-hmm. What if it's like considered that like art and not? Well, th- that's why there's the exception for serious literary, artistic, political, scientific. So that last item there is, is exactly what you're talking about, Rick, is, is to, you know, have an out for, you know, for instance, uh, a great book that comes out, you know, it's an 800-page novel, it's like it's up for the Nobel Prize, but there's some really heavy sex scenes in it, you know, which are indistinguishable from, you know, pornography. But when viewed in the context of the, as, as a serious literary work, it, you know, it's not going to get... Uh, Band or something like that. Yeah, that reminds me of like Fifty Shades of Grey stuff. Mm. Like, cause like it's a book, but like it's about like a bunch of sex stuff. Mm. Mm. It's like allowed, even though it had a lot of controversy, because they were like, this is gonna promote like rape and mm. shit like that. Mm. But it was still allowed, but it, it was really controversial because it had weird sex stuff. In it. Yeah, well, our culture now is so full of, like, challenging material, you know, because partly because the community standards are all over the place, and, you know, and partly because these kinds of tests were created in the 40s and 50s, and things have evolved, and, and people have challenged this, this type of stuff. You know, whenever you get sued for this type of thing, you, th- there's a pushback, and it usually goes to some of the highest courts, in fact, you know, the FCC, as I said, has been at the Supreme Court a number of times because the broadcasters say, hey, you know, it's like you're infringing on our First Amendment rights. You are the government. You're not allowed to stop us from saying stuff. You know, and maybe in community standards, the F word is no longer such a big deal as it was a long time ago. Or I know in other countries you could, like, say a bunch of curse words on TV. Mm. It'll be chill. Like, I know in, in the U.K., is that right? Yeah. Say like oh, yeah. fuck all the time. Wow, I didn't even know that. And then like also the, the the rating is different. Like like for rated R movies in the UK, it's like you could just be like 16. Oh, okay. Have they have different yeah. different standards. And like even on TV, they have more vulgar stuff because they're like, oh, this is fine. Like, so it's it's culturally different. Ferris, what did you want to say about all this? Uh, Speaking of other countries and using foul language in their propaganda films, Stalin, Russia. Well, that's that's combining two different things, but I can go in there. Sure, that's great, because, yeah, Stalin, did he swear a lot? Or? Oh, yeah, he swore and uh, used to make propaganda films. Russians are weird. Though. Huh. Interesting. I don't know. I was, I was telling everybody just before you came in that my son's been writing about... Uh, um, uh, Animal Farm, the George Orwell thing, which is it's clearly, you know, all about all about Stalinist Russia. Um, hey, Mike. We're, we're talking about naughty language on TV. Well, I mean, to come back here to the United States, um, believe it or not, it was comedian George Carlin who helped nail down exactly what words you can't say on the air. Oh, seven, Strange, seven, right? Seven. It's seven, yeah, the seven filthy words, I yeah. think. And, and that's a great bit. Yeah, and it's it's all over YouTube, so you can look at it yourself. But we don't really have time to show it, but I would because it's I, I find it hysterical. And by the way, Carlin, I never knew him much when I was a kid, and he was actually active. But boy, what a master of the language! I yeah. mean, he has he so, really so many insane. bits. You know, he could do great comedy <laughs> just out of like how screwed up words are. So the, basically. He did this comedy bit that was on a record album, and the FCC has no jurisdiction over that, and the, the, which was about, like, what can't you say? And that was put on the air, though, by Pacifica, uh, which is, right, we have KPFA 94.1 over in uh, um, Oakland, and that is still a Pacifica station. In New York City, they played it, okay? And there's this thing called Safe Harbor. You can get away with playing offensive stuff after 10 p.m. and before 6 a.m. So there's like one of the compromises that was settled on uh, for giving the FCC control over offensive language was that, you know, if we're going to 
impinge upon people's First Amendment rights on the logic that it could be harmful for kids listening or something, then let's create a time period when the kids should all be in bed, and then you can you know, say offensive stuff to your heart's content. So between 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., there's what's called safe harbor, which means that you can show you know, blue movies. Like in my age, in my, my day, you know, there might be movies with a quick flash of a boob or something that was on at 11 o'clock or something because it was in safe harbor. Uh, and then there was, you know, also uh, uh, the, the language, right? They put it on at noon. And so one person complained, I think about three months after it was broadcast. It was like a long time after. And uh, it went through a series of court cases till it got to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court fined Pacifica and said, you know, Carlin said this, 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 these seven words. And so even now, when you are, you know, doing the FCC exam so that you can be on air on a radio station or something, there are questions about those words. So, you know, it, because it's, it's kind of still, it's kind of hard to pin down exactly what would be offensive, it, just as it is exactly what is obscene. It's hard to pin that down, but those seven words have been pronounced upon by the Supreme Court. So at least we know that. So it's a weird little story, right? Uh, but in, in subsequent eras, you know, remember the wardrobe malfunction, that kind of, so that went to the Supreme Court as well, bundled with a couple of other cases, um, which was, I think, NYPD Blue showing a woman, like, her, Partly nude, but it was it was like masked out. Side or something. Yo, it was even like there's there's a there's a little kid who comes upon this woman who's taking a shower, and basically his head blocks her chest, and so like, like even his ears are involved in the framing. It's like so carefully and stupidly done. Anyhow, a number of those were bundled together, including Bono saying giving an f bomb on the Grammys. Or this was fucking amazing, and, you know. And so all of that, and and um, so these broadcasters said, well, FCC, you, you don't, you know, you shouldn't be doing this to us. It's our First Amendment right to say what we want. And uh, in that case, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, which was tending more more conservative at that time, basically said, well you know, uh, we're going to let these broadcasters off because the FCC was not clear enough that it was going to be enforcing these things. So, for instance, the F-bomb they, and, and the wardrobe malfunction uh, used to be excused. You wouldn't get fined because you say, well, we had no control over that. We didn't know it was going to happen. You know, ha, ha, ha. Uh, well, with the F-bomb, that's true, I think. But the wardrobe malfunction, I think, was probably worked out in advance. But they would, they would hide behind the idea that, well, it's live and we couldn't avoid it. Uh, but at, at that time, there was like one of those, what we, remember we called, talked in the last class, these moral panics, you know? With, I don't know if, I don't think it was Al and Tipper at that point, but it was, you know, next generation. This is basically saying it's too, you know, there's too much explicit stuff on TV. So, so the FCC cracked down and the Supreme Court eventually said, no, we're going to give you broadcasters a pass this time because, you know, the FCC had been letting that kind of thing go and not anymore. So now it's all, it's, it's kind of all messed up. Like it's one thing, one thing that's a guarantee is if you try to find a broadcaster, they're going to fight it and they're going to fight it based on the first amendment that, you know, you shouldn't do it. So for, for tests and stuff, do remember about the safe harbor, right? The safe harbor from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. So even if we try to cheat, treat kids, you know, with kid gloves, treat them differently, um, there is this safe harbor when they're supposed to be asleep. So then, you know, anything can be on. And do remember that the FCC only has jurisdiction over transmitted material. So if it's on cable, uh, the FCC doesn't get involved. So that's why HBO can be a little more risky, stuff like that. However, uh, in terms of if it's judged obscene, then it's a state, you know, a state issue. And different rules can, you know, you can, you can go to jail for obscenity uh, in, in broadcasting in, in many states. So that could be something. Uh, anything else? Well, we're like two, three minutes away from the end. So I would say... Um, next week we are, uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> there's more, <laughs> but there's more, but we've had such an interesting talk that just,
piling on more stuff just kind of deadens everything. So look, next week is mostly dedicated to uh, reviewing for the final. And uh, um, you know we'll, we'll catch up on this, the last few slides. We'll do some cahoots. We skipped entirely the chapter on movies. So we might uh, watch a movie and talk a little bit about movie history or something next week. I know, it's good. It's just basically hosting. Oh, well, I don't know. If, that was hilarious. I don't know. Maybe we could take a vote or something. That is, that is, that's media. So which one is better, the the Netflix or the Hulu? Never saw the Hulu. Uh, Netflix. The Netflix, Netflix is better. Crazy. Okay. All right. Well, we'll keep that in mind. As long as we get analytical, I think that could be just. Oh, we could definitely get analytical. All right. Okay. I mean, it's, cool. it's a, definitely like a commentary on modern culture and like and the Instagram influencer, influencers yeah. and oh wow okay it gets, it gets into that yeah. okay interesting cool I mean this reminds me another thing I'd like to get from you next week is just some suggestions I'm doing a media literacy class which is basically you know looking at media kind of critically and saying you know what's messed up about this like either the message is giving us or you know whether it's dominated by one kind of ideology or another so I just ask next week, just for your help, like, what would you guys find the most interesting types of television examples that I could use in my course? Because it, it's all going to be online, but as I was telling these guys, we can license these things. I can show them online. But I would like to know, like, what's the most pertinent stuff that you guys could think about? You know, I was thinking about Riverdale, for instance. Yes. We could look maybe at an episode of that. You know, and, and but any you know, what's the context? Well, the, the, the context is is it's it really really a thought provoking television. I don't like it anymore. Basically, the wire. <laughs> the wire. Yeah, and the tough the thing that's tough about things like the wire is how do you get one episode which is watchable that is going to yeah, sum yeah. up yeah. everything. It's true. So, Five but seasons, yeah, so, but give us some thought. Aspects. Help me out. Yeah, help yeah. me out seriously. And so next week, or you know, even you just email me your top three. But I'll yeah. I was going to do it today, but we had again more to talk about. I'll pass out a little card. I'll ask you. You know, note down your top three shows for my class. <laughs>